ashes. Individually, its particles are light, but together they become heavy burdens, filling our insides with darkness. As we receive his love, we're filled with his light, exposing us to the image of God that was implanted within us. At that moment, our ashes are exchanged for the beauty God created within, illuminating his light in and through every aspect of our life. Yes. Well, like she said, my name is Holly Brock. I am a native of Dothan, Alabama, born and raised, and I have been in Gainesville, Florida for about seven years. Um, my job brought me here. I am a director in mental health with the Department of Veteran Affairs, and so every day I provide therapeutic strategies to our service members, um, active duty, and their families. Um, also, in my fun time, I enjoy all things fitness, so I'm also a certified group fitness instructor, so I like using my energy and motivation uh, to just help get the body moving. Um, I think it's so interesting that I'm following um, Miss Myra, because Myra came for your body. I'm about to come for your whole soul, so I hope that you are ready. Um, please Make sure that you are dropping comments. Um, if you have questions, if I hit on something, put those in the Q&A because I'd be more than willing to kind of circle back around and make sure that I am answering any questions that you may have. All right, guys, so let's get started. So my topic today is going to be the effects of trauma on the soul. And so many of you can say that there may have been traumatic experiences that you have dealt with. Why is this important? It's important because a lot of times those traumatic experiences prevent our light from being able to shine. Let's go to our next slide. So we all know this song. It says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Then it goes on to say to not let Satan blow it out. I want you to take note right there. It says, I'm going to still let it shine. Then it comes back and reminds us, don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Would you have thought that being a young child, that putting these words into the atmosphere, that you put an automatic target on your back? Because we know that the enemy is the prince of the so as a little child, we sing these songs that are so innocent and so cute, but at the same time, we would not need to say not to let Satan blow it out unless, in fact, the enemy set out to blow out our life, right? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So it is important that we know that because you're declaring and decreeing that this is my life, I'm going to let it shine. It also sends a message into the enemy's camp because the enemy does not desire for your light to shine. One of the ways that the enemy prevents your light from being able to shine is through trauma. Trauma is the response to a deeply distressing or disturbing event that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope. It causes feelings of helplessness diminishes their sense of self and their ability to feel a full range of experiences and emotions. So when we think about trauma, trauma can be anything that has impacted us. Many of us were impacted and traumatized as children. So our light was blown out at an early age, but also it prevents us from fully letting our light shine as adults because of those experiences. What you need to know is that some people develop symptoms that go away after a few weeks. This is considered an acute stress disorder. But there are also those who may experience symptoms that last more than a month and are seriously affecting that person's ability to function. Why is that important? I'm not able to function in, a full, in the full capacity that God has created me to be, then how is my light able to shine? If I am not able to function in the full capacity that God has created me, how then is my light able to shine? This is also known as post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is used a lot in the military. This thing that PTSD is only ascribed to those that may have experienced some sort of combat stress. That's not true. 
PTSD means something happened after the fact. You realize that you were traumatized after the fact. You realize that your emotions were impacted after the fact. It's post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people don't even realize that they have PTSD. Sometimes until months or even years after the event, if they notice it at all. So one of the things that we're going to talk about are different type of wounds that occur in the soul. So soul wound, soul wound number one. And again, we're talking about how trauma affects our soul and in that how that determines that our light shines or not. So soul wound number one is the wound of rejection. Rejection can be defined as the act of pushing someone or something away. Rejection also can be the result of never being accepted. So what does that look like? Many of us may have been rejected in our mother's womb. Well, what do you mean, Holly? Some mothers, although they're pregnant, they didn't want to be pregnant. So that spirit of rejection now gets on that unborn child, and now they're born with the soul wound known as rejection. We're talking about the wound of rejection. So what is the spirit of rejection? It is the sense of being unwanted and unable to receive love from others. Symptoms of the spirit of rejection include perfectionism. Oh, come on now. How many of you deal with perfectionism? Well, what does that have to do with being rejected? Those people that strive for perfectionism, it's all about being accepted. So if I do everything just right in that person's mind, it increases my chances of being accepted. It also produces fear the fear of being rejected. Maybe it's not that you're shy. Maybe in fact, you'd have a fear of being rejected so that you say that you're shy as a way to protect yourself and keep yourself from being able to interact with others. That shyness now becomes your defense mechanism because you have a fear of being rejected. We're drawing from life. Oh, that looks like depression. You know, maybe it's not that you're absolutely depressed. Maybe in fact, what you're dealing with is that spirit of rejection. Some people that also deal with rejection have pride. And we know what that prideful spirit looks like. Self-reliance, those that are people-pleasing. Oh, lust, come on, y'all. People that deal with lust oftentimes deal with the spirit of rejection because I'd rather have anybody than nobody. And I know we've all been there as women. We sometimes put ourselves in position because we want to be loved. We want to be accepted. So we have this lust spirit that comes on us because it's all about self-gratification in the moment. Insecurity, inferiority, and then also shame. Isaiah 49 and 15 states, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have a no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. So this is God reminding us that even if you are rejected, again, going back to sometimes people are rejected in infancy. It doesn't matter that even if your mother rejected you, God says that I will never leave you. The scripture also teaches us that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. Isaiah 53 and three says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. We're talking about Jesus here. Jesus received most rejection than any of us can ever fathom. He was rejected. And then going on talking about rejection, Jesus was rejected by Peter. He was also rejected by the Pharisees, Sadducees, and other religious leaders. Oh, we know the story of Joseph. Joseph was rejected by his brothers after he shared his dreams and was ultimately sold in slavery. Then there was Ishmael, who was the product of desperation. Sarai plotted and had Abraham have sex with Hagar. We know that story. What about David? David was rejected by Samuel when he came to anoint a son of the house of the a son of the house of Jesse. King Saul rejected David because he did not think he was qualified to fight Goliath. Have you ever been rejected by someone who couldn't see the call on your life? Has anybody ever rejected you because they couldn't see what God was doing? So they reject you, not because you've done anything, but maybe you were rejected, but because they can see what's on your life, right? David was rejected because he didn't think he was qualified. They didn't think he was qualified. So sometimes you being who you are ultimately leads to rejection. So that's why it's important that you know who and who you are. Because as we go through this journey of life, 
we will face rejection. But even in that, we cannot allow that ejection to now let our light not shine. We know that a Samaritan woman was rejected five times because she met Jesus at the well. And he was like, sis, the husband that you have now is not even your own. So what was she doing? She was rejected. And there's been all sorts of studies to say, well, you know, has she been married five times? Was she widowed five times? You know, has she had other women's husband five times? Really doesn't matter, I think, the logistics behind who or how she became the woman at the well. The fact is, for her to be with man number five, think about what that did to her soul. She's with the fifth man. And Jesus pointed it out. He was like, the man you have now is not even your own. Rejection. Rejection has a way of making us act out of character. Rejection has a way of making us do things that we would normally do because of the pain of it. Rejection is trauma on your soul. I hope y'all are hearing me and following me this morning. And I hope that I'm making sense. So other things when we think about rejection, sometimes we assess ourselves as a meaningless person. We have lack of, re lack of respect. Um, we consider ourselves as a family freak, defending yourself by refusal, anxiety, anxiety. Some people that deal with anxiety is often at the root of it is that rejection. We anchor ourselves in the material world through a sense of being busy and then going back to that perfectionism. All right, guys, soul wound number two, the wound of abandonment. Abandonment is trauma involves experiences that make us feel unsafe. So when I've experienced abandonment, it now creates this feeling of unsafe. It causes me to feel insecure and alone. And typically, abandonment first shows itself in childhood. Abandonment can be grafted in a child, say, for example, if they never knew who their father was. I think we see that more common than not. And the child may grow up and just say, well, I don't know who my father is. And on the outside looking in, you may think, well, they're okay. Like they don't know who that person is, but it creates the spirit of abandonment. It creates abandonment within that person because they don't know who their father is. And it can cause that individual to feel, well, maybe I wasn't good enough. You know, maybe he didn't love me or whatever that person is that they feel should have been in their life. When that person is no longer there during childhood, that's how that abandonment typically comes up. This can become overwhelming and lead to symptoms of anxiety and distrust. So let's talk about those trust issues just for a moment. How do trust issues show up as a result of abandonment? It's almost like I'm going to get you before you get me. If you've ever been abandoned, let's think about a relationship that may be ended unfavorably. You didn't know what happened. They ghosted you per se. Well, create abandonment issues within you. And now as you enter into any other sort of relationship, that abandonment shows up again, but it doesn't call itself abandonment. Now it calls itself, well, I don't trust you. And anytime that feeling surfaces, the way that you respond to those feelings of abandonment is by accusing you know, by making accusations, but also you have an overwhelming feeling of untrust. This does not only apply to relationship, but it also can apply to other relationships. Well, let me back up. It doesn't just apply to intimate relationships. It can also apply to family. It can also apply to friends in any manner that you feel that somebody should have been there and they abandoned you. So now you have trust issues. Psalms 27 and 10. Though my father and my mother abandon me, the Lord gathers me up. So what does this mean? A lot of times when people feel abandoned, they also feel scattered. So if the Lord knows that I've been abandoned, then he's going to gather me up. So regardless of why you may be experiencing those feelings of abandonment, regardless of why you may be experiencing those feelings of distrust, again, what does the Bible say? The Lord will gather us up. Again, if we have scattered, how does our light now shine, right? Our light has to be synchronized with the Holy Spirit because that is also the light that shines through us. But we have to be willing to address these areas that have caused us trauma in order for our light to fully shine. Can your light shine through trauma? Absolutely. But if you haven't dealt with some of that trauma, your light is diminished. Maybe it shines, but maybe it doesn't shine as bright. Or maybe your light flickers. 
Sometimes it shines, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on how your trauma is affecting you in that day. So it is so important that we put forth the effort. People with abandonment issues may experience problems in relationships, of course, because they feel that the other person may leave them. Fear of abandonment is not necessarily just a standalone mental health condition, such as depression, but it falls into the category of anxiety and even a phobia. So a phobia is a heightened sense of fear. So it's one thing to, you know, maybe be concerned that a person, you know, may be leaving or a situation may be ending, but it's a completely different scale when it's a phobia, like it consumes you. That's all you think about. That's all you breathe is the fact that this person has a potential of leaving you. What about when that abandonment now presents itself in situations? Maybe it's not a person, but maybe it's a circumstance. Well, how does that show up in real life? You have this fear of being fired. Unrealistic, like you really haven't done anything, but there is just something that comes up that you feel you can't trust your supervisor, you can't trust the company, and so you have a fear of being fired. Individuals who experience abandonment in childhood may find themselves drawn to people who will treat them poorly. Oh, I'm going to say that again. People who have experienced abandonment in childhood may find themselves drawn to people who will treat them poorly and they eventually leave them. Leave them. When this occurs, it now reinforces the fear and the distrust of others. So what does this look like? You may have always heard these stories of, or known of women. It's like, you always pick these guys. Like they, you pick the worst men. But maybe at the root of that is that abandonment because they're more accessible. Even when I think about victims of domestic violence, a lot of times it can be difficult for them to not get themselves back into those same situations. And why is that so difficult for them? Men or you can say any other type of person that uses abuse as their form of power, they start off really, really good. You know, they're, they're everything that this person could have ever imagined. So it's kind of like hook, line, and sinker, like they get them. But then it changes. And so now they feel trapped and they feel stuck, but then they want to do all of these things to make sure that this person doesn't leave them because of that fear of abandonment, and they do. And then the cycle just repeats itself because that basically isn't healed. People that, are, that have dealt with abandonment, they're people pleasers. They give way too much in relationships. They have an inability to trust others, pushing others away to avoid rejection, feeling insecure in romantic partnerships and friendships, codependency, a need for continual reassurance, and they have a need to control others. Soul wound number three, the wound of humiliation. To reduce someone to a lower position in one's own eyes or other eyes to make someone feel ashamed or embarrassed. A feeling of shame is a result of being disgraced or deprecated. The feeling often sometimes leads to depression and deterioration, and it also produces low self-esteem. So we're talking about being humiliated. When we are humiliated, we can almost feel our heart shriveling and we shrink. So think about that light example one more time. You're going about the world, letting your light shine. You're illuminating. You're doing everything that God has called you to do. Then you run into somebody who maybe doesn't understand the call in your life. They humiliate you. Who do you think you are? Who ordained you? called you and now they're speaking all of this negativity on you and god forbid they do it in front of a group of others right they've embarrassed you in front of others so now you shrink and what happens to that light it diminishes sometimes it's like the enemy can use people that blow can be so devastating that it completely blows your light out so on one hand you are on fire for god going about the father's business but now that you've been humiliated, your light is not shining at all. We may become preoccupied or obsessed by that humiliation and its imagined perpetrators. We may react with anger, fantasies, revenge, 
statism, delinquency, or even terrorism among others. We may also internalize the trauma leading to fear, anxiety, flashbacks, nightmares, sleeplessness, social isolation, apathy, and depression. Within America, we've seen a lot of stories about people that are like doing mass shootings. And a lot of times at the root of that, when they, in, when they have the opportunity to um, maybe interview um, those people that have been involved in those shootings, the perpetrator, when they interview them, a lot of times they say, well, I was bullied, I was picked on and all of these other things. No, I'm not saying that it's right, but I'm just trying to help you get an understanding that that's what humiliation does. And that individual, so now they go about trying to get even. They're obsessing over the things that that person has said because they've been humili humiliated a lot of times in front of others, so they react in anger. Matthew 5 and 39 through 40. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have it, your cloak as well. So this is saying it is not our responsibility to try to get even with those that may have humiliated us for those that may have embarrassed us. We're supposed to turn the other cheek. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Humiliation is an act that causes a change for the worse in a position of the victim and in the victim's feelings about himself and his relationship to the world. Power is central, the victim, and the act of humiliation can be described not as a feeling, but as being humiliated. And it forces that person to feel like they no longer have power. Humiliation results in a person feeling powerless. And sometimes that's one of the things that we struggle with, even with the enemy. Sometimes if we are not sure in who we are and our identity, we can feel that we don't have power over the enemy, but we know that he's defeated. We do have power. But it's about us recognizing that and stepping into the place of being called to be. Humiliation can also manifest as shame, but it also can manifest in physical abuse. Symptoms of those who have experienced humiliation, they have a desire to serve everyone they love. They have a restraint in words, the tendency to justify others, reluctance to admit sensuality, fear of punishment, or having joy of life. So think about that just for a second. People that have been humiliated have a fear that they will also be punished by enjoying life. They have a fear that they will be punished by enjoying life. They put their needs above others. They compensate for their differences. And they have a talent for making people laugh. And so you can think about people who are just jokesters. They are always funny, always cracking a joke. But sometimes at the root of that, it could be that they're truly funny people. But at the same time, it could be a defense mechanism. Because if I'm always making you laugh, or if I'm now making jokes about myself, it robs you of the opportunity of now making a joke about me. Like we know I have big feet, right? Or we'll go ahead and make a joke about it. Or, you, or we know that I have a speech pediment. Whatever that thing is that maybe you feel embarrassed by or has been used to humiliate, humiliate you, what you now do is you go ahead and make a joke about it so that the other person can't do so. Soul wound number four, the wound of betrayal. Uh, betrayal is when someone you trust lies to you cheats on you, abuses you, or hurts you by putting their own self-interest first. Betrayal is seen as a loss. Betrayal is probably the most devastating loss a person can experience. And I know that we all can think about moments in our life where we felt betrayal. And again, it's not necessarily the experience of betrayal, but it's the event it becomes the primary relationship that one considers extremely disturbing, but also damaging. Research suggests betrayal trauma symptoms are deeply impactful and can have long-term effects to one's overall mental health. Experiencing betrayal is a form of emotional abuse, can cause various post-traumatic stress disorders. Symptoms include flashbacks, nightmares, impaired sleeping, depression, anxiety, Distrust, disassociation are also common. Disassociation is almost like extreme um, 
like daydreaming, like they disassociate, like they having a real life experience. But if you were to talk to them about it, it, it's not associated with what's going on currently. So they may explain to you something that doesn't make sense to you, but in their mind, it's real because the trauma from that has been so painful. Their current reality is too much for them to live within. So now they create an alternate reality, right? That's what this association looks like. It becomes partner feeling as in their reality and has been shaken to its core. Sometimes the forms of betrayal come in relationships, and then sometimes it can be disorienting and also heartbreaking. And we're talking still about how it affects our soul. Some of the symptoms of betrayal, um, striving for honors, titles, the need for special and, and being important, attaching importance to reputation, lack of tolerance for lies of others, but they are also a liar themselves. Can you figure that one out? They have I expectations of others, but a lot of times those expectations are unrealistic. And that's because it goes back to the root of their own betrayal. They use manipulation and control. Who does that sound like? Jezebel. This is Jezebel in her purest form right here. This is Jezebel. Strong need for all planning and lack of flexibility in relation to unforeseen situations. They have a distrust of the opposite sex, problems with discovering and confiding to others. They draw conclusions. They are oftentimes seen as old senses. So soul wound number five, moral injury. Moral injury is understood to be the strong cognitive and emotional response then occur following events that violates a person's moral or ethical code. So within the body of Christ, the Bible typically becomes our moral and ethical code. Outside of that, we all have our own values and standards that we try to live by. But what happens is when I've experienced or witnessed something that goes against what I strongly believe in, now it's considered a moral injury. Moral injury is damage done to the soul of that individual. It is traumatic, usually stressful circumstances. People may perpetrate, fail to prevent or witness events that contradict deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. When someone does something that goes against their beliefs, this is referred to as an act of commission. And when they fail to do something in line with their beliefs, that is often referred to as an act of omission. Individuals may also experience betrayal from leadership. Come on, y'all that have been in the church for a long time. You may can even think about a situation right now where you felt like you were betrayed by your leadership and it created moral injury. But what does that look like in context of the church? So moral injury is a distressing psychological behavior. It's social and sometimes has a spiritual aftermath from the exposure of the events. Moral injury can occur in response to acting or witnessing behaviors that go against those moral beliefs. So what about spiritual trauma? We talked a little bit about moral injury and leadership. What is it in the church? It's church hurt. Moral injury in psychology is considered church hurt when we look about it from a spiritual context. We'll help that make sense. This can be the result of either abuse by religious spiritual figures or being raised with a toxic and overbearing interpretation of that religion or spiritual belief. So again, going back to talking about sometimes we felt like we've been betrayed by those who have authority over us within the church, within the ministry, within whatever box you want to put yourself in, but it usually results in church hurt. And then I just did that slide. So, we can see that one. so it's considered usually stressful circumstances. Um, and then we did that one too, so we can skip that one. Moral injury is considered to be a strong cognitive and emotional response. And it also occurs after the event. And then it talks about the relation to the soul. And I think we've done all of these. I think my slides are repeating. Yeah, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Y'all didn't tell me I was going the wrong way. I'm sorry, guys. I just realized I was going the wrong way. All right, here we go. But we have this precious treasure. The good news about salvation in unworthy earthly vessels of human frailty so that the grandeur and the surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God. His sufficiency 
and not from ourselves. Again, keep in mind those soul wounds as we read this. We are pressured in every way, hedged in, but not crushed, perplexed, unsure of finding a way out, but driven to despair, hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted to stand alone. We are struck down, but never destroyed. Always carrying around in the body, the dying of Jesus. The resurrection life of Jesus also may be shown in our body. For we who live are constantly experiencing the threat of being handed over to death to state, so that the resurrection life of Jesus may also be evidence in our moral body, which is subject to death. So physical death is actively at work in us, but the spiritual life is actively at work in you. So in conclusion, I just wanted to encourage you, regardless of the traumatic experiences that you may have done or endured, it is still time to let your light shine. We have the ability to heal from those things. We have the ability to give all those situations over to God, knowing that he can do great and mighty things through us. But it's first about us recognizing that there may be areas in our life that maybe my light isn't shining so bright. And then once I have an understanding that maybe I've allowed my light what do I have now? What is my responsibility to make sure that when I show up in the world, that I show up fully illuminated, not dim, not barely shining, not hiding my light under a bushel? No, because we're making a choice today to let our light shine. Thank you.